Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 39th edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who is joining us for the first time. I'm just going to quickly run through some of these uh, introductory slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Uh, for anybody joining us for the first time, the, generally speaking, the companies that we have presenting on here each week are under 300 million in market capitalization. They're in revenue and generally approaching cash flow break even are already profitable. We tend to focus on companies outside the resources and biotechnology sectors. Uh, so what I say is it's a broad mix of industrial microcaps, which spans microcap technology, um, media companies, niche retailers, um, hardcore industrial products or engineering businesses. So quite a broad mix, but uh, just to give you a sense of what we mean by industrial microcaps. And as I say, we've been doing these weekly since about March. Before that, we're doing them fortly, fortnightly. Uh, we run them over the hour. Each company gets 30 minutes. Uh, in which we break it down into a 20 minute presentation and 10 minutes of Q&A. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. Just makes it easier to moderate for me uh, and for our presenters at the end. Uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel uh, tomorrow morning around 9 a.m. Uh, if you want to follow Coffee Microcaps, you can follow us at Twitter, as I said, YouTube for the recording of this webinar and indeed all the previous ones, uh, LinkedIn for some additional long form content that I do. And I also write a weekly paid uh, subscription newsletter where I profile one interesting ASX microcap stock every week. And you can find that on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, so just coming up first, we're going to have Tony Abraham, CEO of AI Media Technologies. And then after that, then we're going to cross to Jeff Bainbridge, CEO of Lark Distilling Company. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tony. So I am going to stop sharing my screen. And then Tony... Uh, I can see your cover slide now, Tony, so you're ready to go. Just struggling on audio, Tony. I can't hear you coming through. Sorry, can you hear now? I can indeed, Tony. You're you're good now. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Uh, so my name is Tony Abrahams. I'm the co-founder and CEO of AI Media. Um, AI Media uh, is a one-stop shop uh, for captioning, translation, and transcription solutions, uh, both live uh, and uh, recorded. Um, our secure technology. Uh, is a cloud-based platform uh, which translates uh, speech into text um, in multiple languages um, and is really um, informed by uh, both technical uh, uh, technology and uh, human intelligence. And we'll, uh, I'll, I'll run through a bit of that um, as we go through uh, the presentation. Um, before um, stepping into this, there, the captions are available in multiple formats uh, on this webinar. Um, for those of you uh, on the Zoom, you can enable uh, the closed captions on uh, the Zoom webinar where you can uh, see those captions. Um, but alternatively, there are also uh, some links uh, that were um, uh, placed in, in the chat panel. And I'll just um, flick across to, uh, to that screen now so that you can see how that comes up. Um, uh, Mark, hopefully you can see the caption screen coming up now. I can, Tony, yes. Great. And so this is really uh, designed so that someone can follow uh, in writing uh, what is being spoken in a way that's really easy to understand. Uh, you can see that I can scroll up uh, and go back to a uh, full um, uh, uh, transcript of, of what Mark started with. 
Um, and then on this page, uh, there's multiple ways that you can actually uh, present the font. Um, uh, for people with dyslexia, um, this, uh, what I call the Aussie font, uh, the green and gold, uh, is actually uh, often the most readable. Um, but you can see that there are uh, multiple different ways um, to contextualize this uh, for different people uh, uh, um, and their preferences. So do please play around with that um, as, uh, as we go through uh, the presentation and I'm happy to take questions uh, at the end. Um, one thing to say at the outset is that we are in a blackout period, so I won't uh, talk about financials any more than I have already shared uh, with the market. And so the numbers that you're seeing uh, here uh, represent uh, what our prospectus forecast uh, was. Uh, we listed AI media technologies uh, on the 15th of September 2020. Um, and so we're just coming out of our first uh, prospectus period. Uh, we have um, confirmed to the market that we will hit or exceed uh, those prospectus forecasts. Um, and uh, we have uh, continued to grow the business in excess of our uh, long-term CAGR um, of 18%. Uh, in fact, the FY21 uh, numbers uh, in the prospectus forecast represent a 20% uh, growth uh, year on year. Um, and with expanding margins, and as Mark highlighted, also a move into profitability. Uh, the business was established in 2003 and the very first customer we had was uh, Foxtel and uh, we introduced captioning way back in 2003 to uh, the cable and satellite industry uh, in Australia. Um, but over time we've, we've significantly expanded uh, both the product set, um, uh, the technology intensiveness um, uh, and also the markets in which we're operating. We are now a truly global business um, having invested uh, over $50 million uh, in our industry leading technology platform uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and we have acquired three businesses uh, since listing uh, for a, a total value of $48 million. We have over 2,200 uh, customers and more than 3,000 uh, contractors uh, who help us to deliver really accurate services like you can see uh, today um, for customers like Channel 9, Deloitte, the World Economic Forum, Amazon, Facebook, and the United Nations. Uh, in fact, any of the captioning that you see on Channel 9 or Channel 7 across Australia uh, is done by us. Uh, the total global market um, is anywhere from about 15 uh, to $30 billion uh, a year um, and uh, is growing. Um, uh, as many of you will uh, attest, uh, people are watching more television with captions uh, than ever before. And whether that's uh, people who are hard of hearing, uh, or even if it's just people who are watching on mobile devices uh, or on multiple screens, uh, it has become um, a feature that is used um, by almost everybody. Uh, there are benefits uh, well above and beyond that though, as you can see uh, from the benefit of having uh, that transcript uh, live and immediate. Um, with uh, some of the recent acquisitions, uh, we have actually managed to uh, deliver what is a true one-stop shop uh, for live captioning and translation. Essentially, our product proposition can now deliver live captions in any language, from any language, to any language, and streamed in any format to any device, uh, which means that anytime you want to meet, uh, this is a service uh, that is available. We also have three price tiers, uh, which range from uh, the, the fully, fully premium service, which is uh, what you're seeing today, um, and then a semi-automated uh, and an automated service, uh, both of which outperform the automatic speech recognition that you would get um, out of the box uh, for something like Siri uh, or Google. Our competitive advantages are really to deliver fast, high quality, accurate and secure captioning and translation services uh, for businesses. Um, we are a B2B business. Um, we are uh, ultimately enterprise grade. Um, this isn't a direct to consumer model. So our customers um, are the Fortune 500 companies, leading broadcasters, international organizations, uh, big tech firms, um, and so on. 
the five limbs that really build our uh, build out that technology platform um, is firstly proprietary technology that is uh, backed up by patents and trademarks around the world, um, which delivers uh, a highly secure um, interface and protection of the data for our client systems. We ensure that everything we do integrates, uh, whether it be uh, Zoom or Microsoft Team or WebEx um, uh, or even parliamentary systems. Uh, we have a team to ensure that we can connect uh, to any platform. Uh, of course, multilingual is really key. Um, and as is our global footprint, we have local sales teams uh, in each region uh, that really own uh, their PLs uh, to great success. Um, we did do a transformative acquisition uh, just a couple of months ago uh, for a business called EEG that has really given us this opportunity to increase uh, the intensity of the technology in our business um, and also improve the effectiveness um, and also the efficiency um, of our human curators. What EEG has is ultimately a uh, a box where you can see that, an encoder and a cloud platform, um, which enables uh, video content to be taken from a customer uh, and delivered to any particular platform, um, either over the internet or through traditional broadcast technology. But what they also have built is an ICAP cloud. And what that ICAP cloud does is it connects captioners uh, to the content uh, anywhere in the world so that you can, you can have um, either an automated captioning service, which is uh, called Lexi, a semi-automated service called Smart Lexi, um, or a fully human curated service uh, like AI Live, um, and having people then being able to connect from anywhere in the world uh, to deliver that service. Um, EEG has a market presence in the United States of over 90%. Um, and what we're looking to do is really extend uh, that um, fantastic world leading technology um, outside of the US into uh, both APAC uh, and our EMEA regions. Um, and what we're also looking to do is to um, offer multilingual services across that platform, which is uh, some of the revenue synergies that, that underlie that, um, that acquisition. And for those of you who, who want to dig a little deeper um, on the um, market announcement platform um, of the ASX or on the AI Media Investor website, uh, you can see a, a very detailed analysis of that EEG transaction. What I wanted to um, do a little bit of a deep dive on now is just um, Smart Lexi. Um, and that is a semi-automated uh, uh, real-time captioning uh, service. Um, what uh, is really important to understand is that not all automatic captioning uh, is equal. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll run through a little demo here um, and uh, hopefully uh, you can uh, uh, hear the sound when I play it. Um, uh, Mark, let me know if there's a, if there's a problem. Um, but what I'm about to demonstrate is a clip um, from uh, Channel 9 News. Uh, and uh, what you'll see on the left is an out of the box uh, automatic speech recognition solution. Uh, and on the right uh, is our Smart Lexi uh, solution. So again, um, both are automated, but one uh, has, um, has the smarts, which I'll go through uh, in a second. But I'll just play this very short demo so you can see how these two automatic captioning solutions perform against each other. Good evening. A cyclone emergency is unfolding north of Perth tonight with Cal Barry and Geraldton facing a direct hit from the dangerous Category 3 storm Saroja within hours. Authorities have now declared a red alert situation, warning residents to take shelter and not to move with homes. OK, um, so what you uh, were able to see there um, on the right here is our own Smart Lexi solution uh, where um, on the left uh, was an automated solution um, uh, that is uh, actually one of the leading um, automated solutions. Um, if you looked at what happened on the left, uh, we had a cycling emergency with Hall Halle Berry. Um, and uh, suffice to say that uh, this would com be completely unacceptable uh, for any particular customer um, or indeed any viewer who was relying on those captions uh, to understand what was happening. 
Um, on the right, uh, what you saw was actually the words faithfully represented. Um, so what's really the difference and, and what, what does, uh, how have we managed to improve uh, on uh, the out of the box um, automatic speech recognition? So on the left uh, there in that diagram, we have what is the standard automatic speech recognition systems uh, where you put a whole lot of data and noise um, into a speech recognition engine. Uh, and that engine comes up uh, with what it thinks algorithmically is uh, the best answer. Um, of course, where you have um, uh, a TV show uh, like the one that we were just talking about, where you have um, an unusual cyclone name, uh, an unusual uh, place name, uh, it's going to get very confused and it's not going to come up correctly. Um, so we don't offer that standard out of the box um, automatic speech recognition service because our customers need more. Um, and within uh, what they need, again, there are those three uh, particular uh, price uh, and quality tiers. Um, moving um, from the premium uh, service uh, on the right, uh, where we have uh, people who are listening to what's being said um, and re-speaking it into speech recognition software that is trained to their unique voice print. Um, and moving over to the left, uh, where we have um, uh, Lexi, uh, which is a fully automated solution, um, but uses algorithms to create dictionaries uh, that are relevant to the particular content uh, and tailored uh, to individual customers uh, and individual sessions. Um, what we've released um, as a product uh, just a few months ago was uh, this smart Lexi, which you saw the demonstration of before. Now, that doesn't require a real-time human being uh, to be on air all the time, but what it does require is a human being to curate those dictionaries and tailor those dictionaries above and beyond what the algorithms can do. Um, and that is what we have found has made um, an enormous difference uh, to, to the number of errors that would come up uh, versus uh, what you would see on the fully automated solutions. Um, and so really what we find is customers uh, want uh, their captions and their translations uh, to be reliable um, and they want to take uh, a product at the best possible price point. Um, and what we're finding as the technology improves is that we're able to sell more and more in the more tech in, in, in the technology space, so more smart Lexi and more Lexi, um, uh, and uh, in places where uh, just six months ago or twelve months ago we would have needed the real time human curation to deliver an acceptable level uh, of quality. Um, and then the final thing I want to show before we uh, can move into questions um, is really how we deliver uh, live multilingual uh, captioning. Um, and uh, for those of you who can see the French link, uh, this is how that, uh, that French transcription uh, is being delivered. Um, essentially, we get the live verbal content in, and then we're using that premium workflow. Uh, so that premium workflow that uses a re-speaker, uh, someone who's listening to what's being said, um, and then they are repeating that into a speech recognition engine that is uniquely tailored to their voice print. Uh, which means we get extremely high accuracy, well over 99.5%. Um, that um, speech recognition technology, um, having converted it into very accurate text, um, that text can then be corrected uh, if it needs to be to, to make sure that it's as close to 100% accurate as possible. Um, and then what we have for the multilingual is people who are then re-speaking things into really short, sharp sentences. Um, and what we find is that those short, sharp sentences expressed without metaphor and without figurative language, uh, will then, uh, we then send that up through a machine translation algorithm on top of which we uh, layer a degree of our own artificial intelligence based on that contextual accuracy. Um, and then we can deliver simultaneously uh, into uh, multiple languages. Um, uh, we've been doing this with the World Economic Forum at Davos uh, since 2018. Um, and we have successfully delivered, for example, on their event, uh, over 400 video streams um, and live captions for 153 hours of content uh, with 22 world leaders um, in real time 
uh, in up to uh, 12 languages. Um, and if I just uh, stop that uh, screen share for a second, I'll just go back to the um, uh, product version. Um, what you can see here is the English captions and then on an alternate tab here uh, is the French. Uh, so people can follow on uh, in multiple languages uh, in whatever format they see fit. So um, I'll just pause there, um, head back to the um, other screen and uh, Mark, I think that's uh, bang on 20 minutes. So uh, happy to, uh, to take some questions. And um, yeah, we've got it. I actually one or two that were emailed in ahead of time, Tony, but we've got one from the audience. So let's go with that one first and then I'll uh, get to these ones ahead of time. Um, are there any others that can provide this service with a similar level of accuracy? Um, how will you defend this lead is the question. Yeah, I mean, we are absolutely um, uh, the market leaders uh, in this space. Um, we have uh, come up against and, and done better than very large companies uh, like um, Ericsson, uh, like Deluxe, um, uh, like uh, TVT. Um, and uh, we continue to focus very narrowly um, on the problem that we are trying to solve, uh, which is live accurate captions uh, and transcription and our investment thesis uh, and our um, uh, product priorities um, are focused on continuing to improve uh, that uh, technology leadership. One of the reasons why we acquired EEG um, was because they had market leading technology um, that really helped us uh, to deliver a one-stop shop with the um, uh, uh, with, with the technology that we uh, had already built. Uh, there's no excuse uh, uh, for not staying on top of the game. Uh, we have um, a, a team of engineers of over 50 strong um, who continue to work uh, on that technology leadership. Uh, but the other part that's really important as well is uh, ensuring that we attract the right talent uh, in the business in terms of uh, the people who are ultimately providing that curated service, uh, whether they be the re-speakers, um, whether they be uh, the crowd workers um, who help to tidy up uh, live content um, for subsequent pre-recorded viewing, um, or whether it's the people who are curating uh, those uh, dictionaries. Um, and uh, that absolutely uh, will continue to be uh, the focus of AI media as we uh, continue to seek to, to grow what has been uh, a, a $60 million uh, a year uh, revenue business on a pro forma basis. Uh, now, um, as we look to uh, take ever greater share um, of what is a very fragmented uh, $15 billion industry at the moment. Um, we do believe that there are significant opportunities uh, uh, for business businesses to be north of a billion dollars in, in sales um, as the technology intensity um, uh, grows. Um, and we are absolutely uh, at the front of that pack at the moment um, and looking to extend that leadership in, in coming years. Uh, one of the reasons that we listed um, uh, when we did uh, was to provide us um, access to capital, um, but also access uh, to acquisition opportunities. And I'm pleased to say that uh, the three acquisitions that we've uh, completed uh, since listing um, are going very well. Um, and in fact, the EEG acquisition in particular that we only completed at the start of May um, is well ahead um, of, uh, of, of planning uh, because uh, the fit between our two product sets has just been uh, really hand in glove. Okay, and then one that came in ahead of time is uh, just on pricing and licensing, Tony. Um, you just give a sense of how that would normally work. Is it monthly, yearly? How long do they normally sign up for? Um, just a sense of, you know, if you're dealing with the lights or the UN, what the kind of normal contract would look like. Yeah, it really is a mix. Um, so for our broadcast contracts, they tend to be multi-year exclusive contracts um, with uh, product-based pricing. Um, that will often be um, a rate card, for example, that says live captioning is charged at this rate per minute. Um, Smart Lexi is charged at this rate per minute. 
uh, and then uh, the customers will, will, will simply get a monthly invoice based on, on what they consume. Uh, in the case of the United Nations and other uh, events, it tends to be an event specific um, uh, uh, quote. Uh, and uh, what we find uh, increasingly is that the event partners, uh, the, or the, the AV companies and the event organizers um, are often um, our customer as they seek to provide the best quality service for the end customer. Um, and uh, that's been a very uh, uh, large and growing part of, of our business. Um, and we really are seeing um, the non-broadcast side of our business, the enterprise side of our business, the corporates, the governments, the webinars, um, really, really beginning to take off as uh, captioning becomes mainstream uh, outside of television. And that's part of the opportunity that we see uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of market growth uh, and in terms of AI media um, getting increasing share of what is that growing market. And then the second question was around um, the customer split between the three offerings. So Lexi, Smart, Lexi, and Premium. Um, where, where is it today? And you know, where would you like it to evolve to over time? Um, yeah, uh, that's a that's a very good question. I'll just be careful just to um, uh, just to reiterate, I guess, the information that that's already in the public domain. So I'm not I'm not providing any further information today uh, above and beyond that which is which is already in market. Um, so the uh, Lexi um, already um, uh, delivers the highest volume. Um, in fact, uh, we're on a run rate. Uh, to deliver around 200,000 hours uh, a year um, of uh, Lexi service. Uh, and in fact, the Lexi revenue uh, represents uh, between 16 and 18% um, of the total revenue of EEG, um, uh, which historically has, uh, has been dominated by uh, the hardware um, and the virtualized solutions. Uh, we only launched uh, Smart um, uh, Lexi, and, and before that it was branded Smart ASR um, in May um, of this year, and uh, we've uh, only just signed our, our first customer uh, being Sky News Australia, who we will be rolling uh, Smart Lexi out uh, to uh, from uh, the 1st of September. Uh, we um, fully expect uh, that that Smart Lexi uh, share will continue to grow um, and uh, we will see uh, less of the premium uh, quality captioning as, uh, as both a percentage uh, of total uh, hours, but also as a percentage of, of total dollars. We'll expect to, to see that, that decline um, to uh, uh, give um, more uh, share or in Smart Lexi and Lexi, uh, which of course also are, are significantly um, higher margin uh, and more profitable products. Um, while also providing um, a more affordable price point um, for our customers. Uh, and again, typically our customers uh, want to make sure that they have uh, a service that is fit for purpose um, and uh, they want to pay as little as possible uh, to get that uh, fit for purpose uh, service. Uh, and so um, uh, the cost of um, uh, the premium service. Uh, many of our legacy customers have obviously factored that in uh, to their budgets. Um, but uh, when we spin down to, to Smart Lexi, uh, which is about half of the price uh, of the premium service, uh, and Lexi is about half of the price of Smart Lexi, um, what we fi find is actually when uh, customers are choosing uh, to, to move from the premium service uh, to the Smart Lexi service, they're actually expanding the amount of captioning uh, that they're doing. Uh, and in fact, Sky News uh, in transitioning from um, the premium service to the Smart Lexi service, um, notwithstanding the fact that it's at half the hourly rate, um, they're actually going to be spending more with us uh, over that period. Uh, and that is because uh, they are going to add captions to a lot more content, uh, which is ultimately what they're paying subscribers uh, and viewers um, are asking for. And I think that that's really the, the, the technology story um, going ahead is that um, a little bit of human intervention uh, makes a big difference. Uh, and we're really focused on making sure that we can deliver that um, for the best um, 
uh, possible price for, for each customer at those price points. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks, Tony. We're just bang on time there now. And I do know Jeff is waiting patiently in Hobart for us. So uh, yeah, if you can stop sharing your screen and uh, if we can just get Jeff to start sharing his, we'll, uh, we'll start the second presentation. I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Jeff. You are ready to go. Jeff's audio sorted here. Good morning. I can hear you now, Jeff. Thank you. From a very cold Hobart this morning, bit of uh, bit of fog, and a bit of mist on the ground. So, um, this is a presentation, um, Mark, I gave uh, to ASX last week, and various analysts and anyone who's followed our share price would have seen a, a pretty substantial jump of. To 25% as a result of it. So um, I'll run through it relatively quickly and leave um, plenty of room for questions. So executive summary, the purpose of this was really to give the market guidance on our leaders under maturation. Um, and what that means is you know, for anyone who's new to the business, we're a whiskey business based in Tasmania. We principally sell in Australia. We're a luxury brand. Um, we get measured and sort of valued on two frameworks. One's the balance sheet and then naturally the cash flows and the p and um, In relation to the balance sheet, what we do is um, we have an appreciating asset that increases in value and volume each year. And we update the market in various um, times about where that's up. And this was a major um, update for them. So uh, the, the graph at the bottom gives you a sense of the values of leaders under maturation in our business. And, and I'll talk to how we value it. But in, in essence, we're sort of saying that the end of F21, we have about $236 million worth of whiskey in, in our barrels um, that's sitting in our bond stores. So that what we describe as the whiskey bank um, and that we're forecasting by the end of F22, that'll be closer to sort of 388 million. And you can see in that graph, that's 139% growth uh, this year and uh, another further 55% growth next year. So, how does that work in terms of leaders and under maturation? 30 June, we had a million leaders under maturation. Uh, we're forecasting to grow that to 1.8 by the end of this current, current financial year. And then um, expectation is you'll see similar growth um, in, into F23. Um, the, the growth that we achieved this year from sort of F20 to F21 was mostly done internally through you know, efficiency gains, shift management, um, minimal capex um, at both of our distilleries. The growth, uh, the additional growth we're going to see next year is through an outsourcing program. Um, the other component in terms of value, if that equation of how do you get to 236 or to sort of 388 million, it's, it's leaders multiplied by um, um, what we're able to sell the liquid for. And we, we had a very significant change in the last 12 months in terms of channel and in terms of uh, pr product or SKU type. So, we were able to sort of essentially redirect our liquid into um, higher value channels and higher value uh, product releases. And, and I'll take you through how that works. Um, in terms of channel mix, the primary change in the channel mix, which you can see on here, is the move to, to direct to consumer. So, and the direct to consumer, if you uh, look at the unit sold, is now 24% of the unit sold. But if you look at the value sold, it represents 42% of the value. So. Prior, prior, prior period, 32%, and we've been able to move um, up that channel and move it now to re re reflecting 42% of our sales. Um, you would understand naturally there's a higher value to those sales because they're direct to consumer versus by your traditional retailers and the likes. Um, we, this is a, you know, I, I expect that number to sort of stay at or around, you know, for between, hover between 42 and 50% on an ongoing basis. Um, Included in that number this year um, is the six month lockdown for which, which took out all, all of our hospitality businesses. Um, so, you know, it's probably on a run rate, it's closer to 45% normalized. Um, and in terms of the activities that we've done, we've upgraded our, our venues, our teams, our infrastructure, our website. So it, it's been, it's been a, a proactive exercise um, and, it's, and it's working really well. And in particular, we've also designed products that are really targeting our direct to consumer. 
terms of product and skew mix, um, you know, I think that's the other area of what we've done is, is we've, we've been able to take a range that when, when I took the business over a couple of years ago, maybe had three or four SKUs. Um, it now has closer to sort of 15 to 20. Um, and then in relation to that, what we've, what we've done is had a lot of innovation programs in taking whiskey and finishing it in different barrels and then changing its uh, complexity and its viscosity and its flavor. Um, and then and then releasing that to market and you can see the price strategy there's quite changed quite strange uh, changed so more typically we were selling whiskey for below two hundred dollars and now we're more typically selling whiskey at above two hundred dollars um, and and that's that process is um, value adding it's enhancing it's um, it's exciting for the consumer it's introducing new consumers as well as talking to older consumers or, or um, existing consumers um, it's introducing um, new whiskey occasions, um, whether that be cocktails, um, it's talking to women as well. So the portfolio strategy has worked. We've, able to, we've been able to create this, um, what we call the limited range, and then equal to that is the seasonal range. And those ranges all sort of start from $250 onwards. So if you look at net sales for value we achieved in F22, um, we were at $216 a litre. In F21, that was $139 a litre. So we're, we've been able to increase the value of litres sold by 55%. So, so that's basically saying we're, we've, we've, well, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't argue, I wouldn't suggest to you that we've had a 55% price increase as such, but we've been able to, the net sales that we take in, we've been able to use um, the leaders under maturation that we've got, um, moving into different programs of release and also move it up into channels that are direct, we've been able to get a net 55% increase. So it's fairly simple exercise. You take your leaders under maturation. If you, if, you, if you ran that out over the five years of the maturation cycle and you achieve your 216, it's worth 236 million um, in value. Um, on the balance sheet, it sits there at about sort of 20 or 21 million. Um, and then in F22, We'll, we expect to be closer to about 1.8 million under maturation. So we'll be making, we are making right now somewhere between 13 and 15,000 litres um, a week. Um, that's sort of a gain of that $216. Um, if we were maintain it, we don't expect to see, our, our, our energies are to grow that, but it, we're, we're, for the purpose of these presentations, we're saying maintaining. Um, and again, then you get to a valuation of sort of north of 380 million. Um, to give you a sense of the way whiskey works, we don't we don't wait for a, um, a, a vintage as such, and you know then find out how many grapes we've got and how big the, the vintage is. Um, we we make whiskey every week, and the way you need to sort of think about that is between thirteen and fifteen thousand liters a week, which equals in maturation um, about three million dollars a week of value. For those that aren't familiar with the company, it's a, just a, a closing slide. The overall strategy of the company, in essence, you know, in a in a word or a statement. The plan is to make Lark the Penfolds of Australian whiskey. So we, if you think about all those attributes of Penfolds in terms of premium brand, heritage, multi-price point innovation, significant and meaningful release program, strong consumer, um, focused brand execution. Uh, so I, I can go through those in more detail, but that pretty much captures the mindset of what, what we're doing. We're a single brand, single focus. Uh, we do have a small gin business. It's about 18% of our revenues but 82% of our revenues come from Lark Whiskey. And then I'm happy to take some Q&A. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. We have, uh, yeah, questions coming in thick and fast. So let's uh, jump straight into it. Um, can you talk about the value per litre you can attain by selling the gift packs uh, and why is the expected channel mix between wholesale and direct-to-consumer for gifting? Um, so gifting is a program that's launching this year. It's, it, so in the current financial year, um, we, we sort of, we, we're, we're familiar with it, but we've never seen it as a priority until recently. Um, so there's a really substantial program. And to, and to give you a sense of scale, we, we sold about 12,000 gift bottles uh, last in F21. We're sort of expecting to sell something in the order of 150,000 gift bottles in F22. Um, and associated with that is all appropriate packaging and you know, combinations of two packs, three packs, two with a glass, one by itself. It's starting to roll out. We're, our first gift pack order goes out the, at the end of this month to Dan Murphy's and Coles, and that's part of the Father's Day program. It is, it is our highest value uh, dollar per litre outcome in terms of SKUs because um, we, 
that that we sell it for in a hundred mil, you know, can equate up to sort of north of six hundred dollars per liter. Um, now um, that program is, uh, I, I would imagine that program is going to be as strong online and direct to consumer as it is in um, wholesale. But as you know, in wholesale, uh, it's an off-premise strategy, not an on-premise strategy. And it is the majors, so Costco, um, Dan's, um, um, BWS, you know, First Choice and so on. But there is strong tradition in those um, outlets. So if you go into a Dan Murphy, as you're moving into either Father's Day or Christmas, there's typically a dedicated table that, that is reflects those uh, gift buying opportunities. So new new territory for us, but um, higher margin, uh, sorry, higher dollar per liter and higher margin. And we, uh, we're fairly comfortable we'll be able to sell it very well across both channels. Okay, great. Then the next one, um, I know you touched that the, the outsourced uh, whiskey production, can that only be used in the lower priced symphony range or can you kind of, um, fill in the gaps wherever you want with that, uh, the outsource stuff. Yeah, it's, it's when, when, I think when you sort of, uh, well, the, the short answer is we're not hundred percent sure yet. And, and, you know, you put the, the whiskey into the barrel. Um, so they, they make the new make spirit. It goes into our barrel, our barrel goes into our bond store. And then in five years time, what comes out of that and we, um, make an assessment of how we can use it. Um, so it can, it, it, it has the potential to um, sit in multiple places in our portfolio. Where, where it can't be used is under the Lark single malt classic cast, which is our original original. Now that, that has to still come from our Cambridge distillery. Um, so it maintains all of that um, kind of heritage and history and connection back to it. But, but we, do, we do have a lot of flexibility with that product. It's not, it's not, it's not being developed as an inferior product by any means. It's, um, I, think, I think it's really important that in the context of what we've been doing, um, there is external validation for what we've been releasing. So last year we were rated in the top four distilleries in the world. Um, and that was a rating that's based on the combination of, or the accumulation of, um, of your releases and the scores you've got. So we are, we make that decision mark closer to the time, depending on what the, the quality of the liquid's telling us we can achieve as an outcome. Okay, great. Um, another one then, um... As volumes increase, uh, wanted impact on the average selling price. Yeah, I, I guess that's uh, one you got something you got to be very, very careful about. Yeah, um, it's interesting. We 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 don't have excess whiskey as we sit here today. Um, we we we're, we're constantly juggling allocation um, of of sales orders and allocations of production types. So it's um it is we're really conscious. Like I I, I can't. I don't believe that we'll that our pricing architecture is really uh, framed up and understood, and, and it works for us now. I, I don't see a dramatic change in that. Um, but equally, I don't. You know, I, I have a very strict discounting policy. If, if my sales director was here, he would he would tell you very clearly we do not discount. So um, I'm I'm confident we can manage this um, as particularly in the direct to consumer space as as our database grows and we we, de we increase the depth of our segmentation you know I, I really don't see that that's going to have an impact on us okay and then uh, as a whiskey lover myself uh what is the first step to your export strategy uh, and i guess well, the question it's certainly not Ireland. it's certainly not Ireland. so apologies there but um yeah look our, our we've got a two-part strategy here so we 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 we, we have a gin brand and that allows us to sort of test the market with some export and in particular with some distributors before we hand over Lark. You know, Lark's like the shiny toy. So we've got to be really cautious. We don't foolishly hand that over to, you know, the wrong distributor and then have regrets. So we have a two, two part strategy in that, in that respect. We have Nant, which is our old kind of, um, you know, sort of our older whiskey brand that's sort of second tier for us in terms of, priority and focus and then we've got 40 spotted so we've, we've secured our first export order for 40 spotted which is in august 22 so that's the beginning of f23 that that's a that's around 160 170 000 unit order and that will kind of give us a, a platform to launch into the uk and then we are we we're not in a position today to open up exports because we don't have enough stock um, but we are working hard on that export strategy and I'd expect to see that start in F23 
And I believe it'll start more in Northern Hemisphere and in particular the US uh, would be a real priority for us. Okay, great. And then are you happy with the sell through of Symphony in classic range at the current pricing? Yeah, it's, um, I, I think um, it's an interesting question in the context of where we're, we're just about to get an, um, uh, an excise increase um, in um, August. So there'll be a price change for, for those ones. So they're, they're just about to go up. They haven't been, they've been absorbing the excise increases for sort of six or seven uh, last increases. So um, I, I think that these, they're, they're around the mark. They, they're probably $10 short of where they should be. I'm pretty, I, I don't see any issues with the current sell through. Um, Dan Murphy's in the week, uh, you know, in December uh, last year, had a, a trading week of $100,000 at retail. We were the first Australian whiskey to do that um, verbally, that they were like, you need to plan for 100% growth year on year on year for the next five years. We, we're, we're in a situation where we're, our whiskey is still uh, uh, accessible, but uh, but it's not. It is there's an act, there's an active allocation that's happening in terms of prioritization of accounts and things. So so price price naturally comes into play if we if, if we have um, <clears throat> limited inventories um, relative to demand, then price has to be the moderator of that. So the, the short answer is no. We're happy with the current um, sell through. Uh, but we're aware that demand so, uh, demand dictates that the price um, the price will have to move in in in, in the short term uh, to reflect both the demand uh, the supply demand imbalance, but also the excise. Okay. Uh, next one, uh, can you provide some commentary on the wholesale on premise strategy and progress? As uh, they're saying here, it can be a bit harder for investors to get a handle on that strategy. Yeah, well, the only way you, you sort of get a, a handle on those go out and you know drink in bars and start asking bar stuff because it's a it's it's much more it's less opaque than you know what we would like um, or more opaque and I think um, we historically speaking we we two years ago we were relying on a distributor and for our uh, on the mainland and um, they, we were sort of I don't know whatever number forty in the portfolio or something so we we two years ago we broke that out uh, um, during um, the end of the beginning of COVID, we took that back. We pointed um, um, a number of our own sales team, um, put a national uh, sales director on key counts and so on and so forth. Where where that that initial program, you know, given the COVID has interrupted, you know, the on premise strategy for um, you know hospitality period, and then implicate and had implications for travel and movement. Our, our on premise strategy is only really probably kicked in in the last. Um, three four months, um, and our progress has been really strong. You know, and, and it is concentrating on some of the bigger groups, um, and and we are um, we are also using um, equity as part of that play. You know, so we're tying in two year trading arrangements with some um, options or some access to equity, um, including first pour and so on. We where our our on premise strategy is in its infancy, but it's um, high growth for us, doing very well. And as a general rule, they want limited edition. Um, they, they want a product that is unique uh, rather than generic in terms of classic cask. Okay. And then uh, I know you have touched on it already, but um, a question around the hospitality strategy. Um, is this a profit center? And do you want to expand it to more sites? Yeah, um, 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 it is definitely a profit center. So in terms of us, it, it's it probably probably netting um so it's net profit about a 41 percent to 42 percent margin um, we run labor to sales between sort of 14 and 16 percent cogs at around 18 percent um so for us it's a um it's very much a profit center it, you know often these type of venues uh, uh, uh sit on the marketing line as um, brand promotion um we currently run and operate three venues we're about to open a fourth venue here in Hobart uh, in September called The Still. And The Still will be sort of presenting all of Tasmanian whiskies, not just Lark. And then my expectation would be that in calendar 22, we'll be opening a venue in Sydney, more than likely down around the rocks, where if you can't come to you know, Tas to experience um, you know, Lark or Hobart, we'll bring Hobart and Tas to you. So. Um, very, very good part of our business, very well run, very well organized and um, 
very profitable. Okay, I'm just going to give it a minute, Jeff, and uh, just to see if um, we've got any more questions for the audience. I know we've rattled through um, eight or nine here already. Ah, here's another one. Um, uh, how regular do you release the limited release of rare cask um, products? Yeah, so the rare cask series is sort of typically, if you're looking from a pricing perspective, is around $1,000 and above. Um, so we, we, we only aim for maybe two releases a year, maybe three, depending on um, what's, what's available to us. So um, a rare cast, for example, is the Para, Para Port 100 year old cast that's had, you know, poured in it for a hundred years. We're then able to put our whiskey in it and we actually you know, are able to finish it in and bring all those flavors through. Um, just right now, and, and it's um, launched yesterday for the wait list, it'll launch on Monday for sale is what we're calling the Mizunara cask. So Mizunara cask is a very rare Japanese tree. Um, it's very, very challenging to work with from a cooperage point of view, but it introduces these beautiful, subtle flavors. And, and for it probably the rare cask series talks to the whiskey collector or the whiskey geek, not the experimenter. Um, so um, those whiskey kind of aficionados would know Mizanara and would know how rare it is, or they would know Paraport and understand how rare that is or broken wood. Um, so we, we're, we're looking at somewhere between, uh, usually around two releases of the rare cast a year, but um, it, it's because it's, because we've obviously got to find something that's really special in terms of cast. We'll, we're annualizing the release of the Para 100. So that'll be an annual release. And then we're looking to roll something extra over the top. Uh, and then, yeah, a question for me. Um... In terms of, you mentioned cooperage there, the sourcing of barrels, or do you guys make them all in-house, um, or do you source, the, source them from Europe or the US or Japan directly? Well, a, a, a combination uh, answer. The, the main, we, ma we mainly work with Seppeltfield, which is you know, Australia's largest four, fortified producer. So Seppeltfield Wines in, um, in South Australia. Um, Warren Randall's the director of our company. He's also a 3% shareholder. Um, he, he has the best barrels in Australia for the purpose of what we do. So we, we secure most of our barrels through Warren um, and an arm's length arrangement. We then, we then from time to time are hunting the world for different barrels. It's, it's easy to get bourbon barrels out of them. Um, the United States because they can only be used once. So that's very easy. It's easy to get your hands on wine barrel. It's more the further limited release to be interesting, like the musket or, um, um, you know, the, 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 those, those casks don't become more and more important. And so we're often hunting anywhere in the world for some casks that are interesting because in the context of whiskey making, it's sort of a one third, one third, one third business. One, one third of the quality of the end whiskey is what we call the new make spirit. So that's what's sort of on screen right now that is made out of those tanks. Those, that liquid then goes into the barrel. So one third of the success of the end product is the nature and the creativity and the intensity of flavor coming from the barrel. And then the last third is really down to the master distiller and their ability to sort of judge, judge where a whiskey's at, understand how to kind of, how to finish a whiskey off and where, where necessary, how to create marriages. So. Um, the barrel strategy is really critical for us. And I know as we sit here today, we definitely have a competitive advantage in the context of the work that we do with Sepultil. Yeah. Sounds like you need to hire an in-house cooper and start making uh, one and two uh, one-off barrels uh, yourself for these uh, ranges. Um, we, we do have, we, 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 do, we, we call them barrel sniffers. So they go, they go to all these old sort of barrel you know, dying grounds and put their heads in barrels and, you know, make assessments of which ones they think are going to create the great flavors. So it's a strange, it is a strange area of whiskey. I can tell you that much. Yeah. I was more thinking like somebody who could, an actual Cooper who could actually make oh, it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. Highly specialized uh, dying industry. Um, what is the end game for Lark in a few years time? Uh, I guess, is this a, uh, you know, a sellout to Perno Ricard or Diageo are uh, more of a, you know, here for the, the long run and just keep going as you're going. We're, 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 we're sort of building the business for the long run and, and behaviorally, Rob, but there's, there's like, there's no doubt we're a public company. We're, we're um, 
our liquidity has changed dramatically in the last two years. Um, you know, sort of our volumes and trades, our, our shareholder base has moved from sort of limited high net worth into you know institutions and associated professional investors. Um, and and the alcohol companies that you refer to, you know, whether it be Perno or Diageo or Beam Suntory or you know, Brown Foreman um, or Remy, they they control 80% of the category in which we play, and that is the hundred dollar plus whiskey market. So they they don't start 80% of the brands. They don't start 30 year old whiskey brands, or you know they they buy them. Um, so the the success here has some high probability, but not inevitability that, that this company will be a takeover target because it's 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 what they do. It's what they like. It's it's what their um, history would show they do often. You know, and we see this in beer, and we're uh, seeing it to an extent in wine. It's no different in spirits. There's always consolidation, and particularly for high value, um, luxury, high margin um, brands, as opposed to they're not looking to buy cheap whiskey. Yeah, exactly. As you say, it's hard to start a 20 year old whiskey brand for, yeah. for, from scratch. Uh, Jeff, I think we're going to leave it there. We're, we're nearly up on time. And um, oh, let's just uh, get this last well, question. because. Yeah, I can see it. they pay they pay both a, a multiple of sales and a multiple of inventory. So they look at both and they they make some assessments as to, um, but the the ultimately they buy inventory because it's a synergistic um, um, acquisition. They're, they they grab your barrels and they just start pushing them out to their wider network. So more typically than not, um, they want a brand and they want the brand to have strength in its home market and be unique. They want a single brand with multiple offerings underneath it and. Um, they do, they pay over the odds, completely over the odds. So that's a positive for us. And yeah, if I can, if I can just take a South African example for where I'm based, if you want to look up um, Perno Ricard, they took over one of the, I guess, first craft gin brands here in South Africa about 18 months ago, a brand called uh, Iverosh, a, a bit similar to, to you, Jeff, you know, family business that started uh, in a kind of, very small kind of coastal town and yeah, Perna Ricard kind of took them over. They're, they're kind of leading craft gin business here. And as you say, they just plugged that into their global uh, yeah. distribution network then after that. But if people want to, I think Google that and um, they'll probably get a fair idea of um, multiples and sales and stuff that was uh, as an example. Um, I know we're talking gin versus whiskey, but I think it, it'd probably be a, a half decent um, reference point. They typically pay more for whiskey because of the 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 time period that you know as as we talked about mark no it, it takes it takes 20 years to build a whiskey brand it take, might take five years or 10 years to, to to mature inventory but it takes it takes years to build a brand and we're and we're just to give everyone context we're 30 years old next year so it's you know we're the oldest tasmanian distillery we're the oldest just um single malt in tasmania um, so, you know, we, we're, we're 30 years into the journey and, and that's where we're getting our momentum now. Okay. Jeff, I think we'll, we'll leave, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. I can say you're our first presenter to join us from the Island state, um, that we've nice. had in this series, <laughs> Good. Good. So break, breaking new ground here as well on uh, coffee micro caps. Um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, as I said, the recording of this will be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow morning. And I'd like to wish everybody a good rest of their Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, man.